when you're setting up one of these ops, and, and you know, just medically, you have to worry about stuff like phone people out, but you, you have to get a good assessment, and you have to go through the process of getting the supplies and assistance, and then receiving them, and then storing them, and distributing them, and accounting for them. And that's an incredible amount of overhead. Uh, it gets a little better as time goes on, but in those first couple of weeks of a disaster, it's a lot of, there's an awful lot of logistics and an, an awful lot of paperwork but you have to track all this stuff. And in preventive medicine, we were worried about both food and water safety, and their sureties, whether they were gonna get it. I, and, and certainly, we needed to know what was going on prior to the storm, just so we knew what the baseline for the population was, because Venezuela doesn't share much with the outside world. And we didn't even know where some of these people had been relocated. They were being taken away. Uh, and that government's pretty, closely held about information. So we had to establish disease surveillance and get into clinics and figure out who was coming in sick and looking for outbreaks of disease, do some education, and really sort of plan our response. And then if you want to look down the road a little bit, we worried about the increasing mosquito population and the increasing rat population, and trying to make sure we we're looking for other diseases and, and seeing how we were doing and then looking at what immunizations we needed to, to come out of there. So it's, a lot of work. And so we had, usually there's command and control and communications and okay, patient tracking. We had to know who we took care of because somebody, somebody's gonna come back and say, you know, I could play piano before you gave me this medicine and now I can't, I'm gonna sue you. That, that happens all the time. So you, you, gotta, you gotta know what you did. And we had veterinary services because animals were, were displaced and animals were sick and hurt. So we had to have vet services and Dentists always come, not only their dental injuries, but we, we end up treating a lot of people for dental stuff they had before the, before the operation here, before this all happened. And we needed blood tests, and we needed psychologists, there's PTSD, you know, acute phase, not PTSD yet. We had to figure out how to link up with NGOs, with all these non-governmental organizations, because that's, if you don't coordinate, it's a mess. And the Pan American Health Organization, which is a subdivision of World Health Organization, and subdivision of UN, is really the folks that were in charge. They're really wonderful people. Claude de Ville de Goyer was the disaster manager for PAO at the time. He's a wonderful man. He's a PBO. PBO is just a private voluntary organization. It's not not, not a publicly funded, but privately funded. Shriners, so those people will show up. Operation Smile, all these people are going to come. So I, our priorities were getting in there, figuring out what we needed to do. That's host nation requested medicines and supplies immediately. They came up with a list of things they had to have. Uh, and then we brought in our subject matter preventive medicine teams, looked at what we needed to do coordinating with, with Pan American Health Organization. And we're worried about what we we're going to do. So it was going to be here's some medical, we're going to come in, get the medicines, get the medical care, get them some fresh water, worry about their food. U.S. makes Venezuelans happy. Maybe that'll just be a stick and we'll go shop his eye. Hugo Chavez loved to poke sticks in our eye. Something went wrong. And, and what, what more could happen than take care of these people until housing gets built and they get back to life as usual? So they're in mudslides. We're in the, over days in mid-December. They, they asked us or responded actually to the fact that we, were, we said we'll come and they said, oh yeah, come on the 18th. We create a joint task force fundamental response Remember, there's always, a, there's always a name for all these things. The military lost this stuff. There's actually a whole book full of these names. So it's like a whole division dedicated to like these three-letter acronyms? Oh, God, yeah. yeah. A acronyms are a way of life. So we set up at the International Airport north of Caracas, and you'll see a map here in a second. But we relief supplies on the 20th. Now, this is, this is important when you think about things like Katrina. It takes 48 to 72 hours for the U.S. government to get there, no matter what. It just does. You can't get there any faster than that because you have to give people orders and you have to get aircraft ready and you have to go through the safety routines and you have to load your stuff and get there. It takes that long for the government, for the big government, the US Department of Defense for instance, to show up. You can't show up in an hour, it just doesn't work. It takes days to show up. Just, it's a large number of people. So 
we started to arrive with supplies and we got within a day you can see we got our our water sterilization plants and we have we have water treatment stuff that's portable and sets up and produces large amounts of water for troops so we flew a bunch of them in and set them up immediately because water was obviously your first priority so we got water folks and then I showed up on the 26th because I really didn't want to be away from my kids for Christmas, so I waited until the 26th to go down there. I am sleazy. I had 100 folks on the ground by that time, the folks who were working for me. So I was the senior person. That disrupts everything anyway. You never show up as the senior person in the first few days because people have to take care of you because you're the boss. And they need to do other stuff. So really senior people never show up in those first couple of days. It's like the president should never show up at a disaster scene in the first few days because, boy, does that disturb the people who are trying to do the rescue and trying to make things happen. Because other they have to worry about them, they have to take them around, they have to greet them. You know. It's a whole mess. So I didn't show up until the 26th. By the 27th, we had Marines offshore who were ready to come in with bulldozers and start working from the coast, that northern coast of Venezuela by Aruba, and, and clear the roads and make clear the roads out and get finally get some road transportation, so heavy equipment you need in. And Hugo Chavez said, oh, you want to bring your Marines into Venezuela? No. We were like, the, we were thinking the same way when Russia offers aid to Iran. Exactly. Our fictional. No, it's just Russian. No, aid. you're not coming on our soil. Yeah, you are our Marines. Big road, big, these big ships are going to come and drop ramps and drive stuff onto my soil. See, yeah, see, the place right in it just it really happens. Okay? This, this was a no, and and these people didn't have any roads, they didn't have any water. We didn't have ways to get equipment to them, and and he refused because he didn't want our folks on his land. That's that happens. Okay? It's be. And so on the 28th of December, I'm down there, and, and on the 28th we're we're seeing some medical problems. We're a, a little over five kilometers from the airport, uh, and just. And we're seeing dogs that are running in the field, little dogs, and they're just running and they're coming over because we're all sort of hanging out in the airport because they wouldn't let us off the airport. They wouldn't let us into Caracas. So we're sort of waving and the dogs come. And the dogs are coming and foaming at the mouth and dropping dead. And we said, wow, that's cool. <laughs> and then we got reports of the fact that looters were dropping dead. Because looters were coming into an area where there's all this storage, we heard. We're told on the other side of the airport there's storage, about six kilometers away. And there, there's a lot of storage containers, and looters are going in to look for food and look for anything in these containers just because there's, the infrastructure's gone. And you can see this is 10 days into the. Well, so looters are dropping dead with unable to breathe, foaming at the mouth. Now that's not normal. Okay, I mean, that, that doesn't usually happen. So this is where things start to go wrong. <laughs> it's like, uh-oh, this is a great injected distractor into your problem. This is a perfect injection into a scenario when you guys are playing. It's like, oh, by the way, half of your team is now can't breathe, they're foaming at the mouth. But what do you do next? Right. right. That, this is a perfect, <laughs> exactly, he's right. this down. At least it's for next year's group. Next time. <laughs> yes. But just a quick look. This is this is where this is happening. You see this the northern coast of South America. And it's just it's actually just below Aruba. Uh, and Caracas is just inland. That's all mountains between Caracas and, and the sea. It's big big mountains. And they all shed their soil and, and all the people who are living on. That's where the thirty thousand people are, is just north of Caracas between there and the airport and Maqueta and Maqueta. So all that stuff is just mud. There, there's no roads. All those roads have been wiped out. And all the secondary roads have been wiped out. So you can see that. There's La Boera, which we'll talk a lot about. That's what it looked like. You can see that this, there's actually, uh, didn't get a really good picture of it, but those buildings there, there's one on the right that's about a 10-story building that was actually lying on its side. It, it actually got pushed over. Uh, it must have been a real thrill when that fell. Talk about a it didn't come apart, it just fell over. It wasn't engineered wrong. 
Just the bottom part? <laughs> <laughs> just, just, just at least the part where they were supposed to put the bolts into the... At least it fell over a pole, though. Yeah, it did. It fell over a pole. Just had to push it back. That's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> just rope on the other side. Yeah, I can rush the helicopter. You can see people looting. You, you, there were people looting in front of it. They didn't really mind having the pictures taken. They were just looting. I mean, they, they were so desperate. The, you know, this is six, ten, eight, you know, ten days in. They're desperate. No, it's not like people are stealing TVs and stuff. I no, would they're, imagine they're, they're trying to survive. Anything, anything to eat or drink, they would just, I mean, they have to have it. They were not looking for TVs. Yeah. You know, they weren't looking for $100 sneakers. They, they, they were out there. And you can see the devastation. I mean, these people have lost everything. You see how the mud just wet, just just absolutely swept through these villages. And Kush Laguera, they pushed everything into the Caribbean. <laughs> That's the Caribbean right there under La Guera. It just pushed everything into the water. This is the port, which you're going to hear a lot about. You see these connexes? Those are the containers, the shipping containers. So they've been sort of broken. They've been tossed around, rolled around, and some of them broken. This is basically the size of six football fields of worth of containers. There are six football fields worth of these containers. It's, a, it's the Venezuelan Customs Impoundment Area. Those where they impounded stuff with customs. And it, it, people had been taking things in and out of there for years. These these two guys were two of the looters, trying to figure out what was inside those boxes. There turned out to be one box that was actually full of bottled water, and that was that was rifled in that mm -hmm. no time. Uh, but that's this is the port. You can see the water. There's a boat. That's water up there under the water. You can see it's a little, just a little harbor area. Uh, but this stuff was right on the water. It was all being parked there. Six football fields worth of these. We knew something was wrong when, on the 29th, some of these containers started launching themselves into the air with an explosion. <laughs> uh, it would be bang, and you'd see this kind of arc off into the sky and drop into the water. So we knew there was something wrong, okay? So, something, Next time. Something was wrong. We called the embassy, who had a hazmat officer. It was there. It was U.S. Coast Guard, which has no officers up there. So this guy thought we were kind of naive, and he'd been in Venezuela, and we'd been in Miami, okay. And so he was in Venezuela, I knew, and he had his coasty, you know, the whites, and, the nice, and his shorts, and his shirt, because it was warm enough that day. And we said, don't you want to wear a little protective clothing? Uh, we don't know what this is. There have been people coughing and dying, and this is launching into space now. I said, don't you want to wear something? He said, it's probably nothing. <laughs> it's on something. And so you know, they got out of our, he got out of the van. <laughs> we were smart. We, we stayed in the van. <laughs> we, he got out of the van and walked into this area, and this huge area. And he starts walking between boxes. And about 90 seconds later, he comes screaming back to the van, saying, spray me with water. Spray me with water. My skin's on fire. <laughs> it was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> I told you so. Exactly. <laughs> I told you so. It has to be an NPC for next year. Exactly. It's, it's just. <laughs> so I, it, we went back to the embassy and got B suits, uh, you know, so put on the plastic suits, and went in and started to drag out stuff because it looked kind of odd that we had to get, uh, that we had to figure out what was actually in this area. Uh, there was still odd-looking silver stuff running out into the water. Uh, there was lots of lots and lots of broken cases and broken vials and spilled liquid and steamy-looking stuff along the ground. Okay, so there we were at the embassy. Got, we said, "Thank goodness, what's happening here?" Well, here's what it was: 90 tons of potassium permanganate, nitrocellulose, 30 tons of it. Nitrocellulose is, is like nitrocellulose. It's what's a tri-nitro. <laughs> it's TNT. Oh. Sulfuric acid, chloric acid, both of which sort of dissolve you. <laughs> I was going to say, I know which those are. Those are bad. <laughs> they're, strong, like they're each one of the strong eight acids. Like so. chlorinated, <laughs> chlorinated fluorocarbons, CFCs, right? Make PCBs. Oh. Acetone. Really good stuff. That's an anesthetic and a liver poison. <laughs> and mercury, metallic mercury. Containers of metallic, nice silver, stuff that's in your thermometer. Mercury. 
So basically, if you swim in this port, your skin's gonna melt off, you're gonna get really high, and your <laughs> mind is gonna be turning to mush at the well, same time. You all Watch this. Here's what happens. Permanganate and acid create an explosion. <laughs> <laughs> and this permanganate is part of what you use for explosives. It, this makes really good explosives. Civil Apparently. War. Yeah, it's it's civil, war, civil War used to be permanganate bombs. Nitrocellulose creates nitrous acid, acid in the smoke, but if you get it wet and it dries, and you jar it, it explodes. That's what was launching the fire. <laughs> so the nitrocellulose, if you get a half a ton of nitrocellulose, it blows this thing about, about 500 yards into the sky. <laughs> so it's a good thing that actually happened. <laughs> so nitrocellulose is really kind of neat. CFCs and acid make phosgene gas from World War I. Oh, phosgene oh. and corn. Oh. That's, it's, that's the cough up your lungs. That's the stuff that, yeah. you know, there's people coughing. So maybe you should just leave this part alone this is solve itself this is what was killing the dogs and the loot yeah so maybe you should wear a hazmat suit when you go in this area is phosgene invisible oh yeah okay yeah and so it's me except you can well you could see the toxic clouds of acid coming off the acid there was actually vapor coming from, from these acids you know because sulfuric acid will leave that little sort of a funny yellowish vapor that was neat <laughs> acetone fumes are anesthesia and liver damage and mercury plus acid makes methyl mercury. Methyl mercury is one of the most toxic chemicals in the universe. And it, it was known, it's known because of Miyamata Bay in Japan that had a methyl mercury spill of about a ton that was the world's worst disaster because it made like thousands of deformed kids and mothers, pregnant women who drank it. Well, it's it just a terrible poison. And, and this was 60 tons. <laughs> with the acid that also had broken and mixed with it as it ran into the water. <laughs> now, that's the Caribbean. Oh, yeah, the Caribbean sea. The problem wasn't the fact that it was the Caribbean and Aruba was on here. You could see Aruba. Okay, that, that was not the problem. I mean, those are rich people on Aruba. I don't care. <laughs> but the current ran east to west. And one kilometer down the coast was the intake for the desalination plant for Caracas's water. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Which was hooked back up by this time. They hooked it back up, and they're making water for Caracas as the methylmercury is going this way. It could have been so much worse for Ashen. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't you. <laughs> so, well, it's a prototype course. So we, we of course, immediately got made calls and got to have the liaison with the, the water authorities in Caracas. And we said, we really suggest that you, you test the water. Yeah. Make sure it's OK. And 24 hours later, they came back and said that the water tests are all negative. And they said, wow, there's methylmercury. We can see the methylmercury going in the water. And I said, well, I mean, how much heavy metal was there in the water? And he said, oh, we don't test for heavy metals. <laughs> Cool. Test for heavy water, heavy metals. That is time. so cool. Okay. I love governments. Okay. <laughs> this is, you know, you should have learned this. You could, if you you can say yes, the tests were absolutely 100% negative. And what you don't say is which test you did. That's very important when you're negotiating. <laughs> okay. You, you need tell the, the truth. gene gas you of vocabulary test. Exactly. Nothing. Exactly. Ran, ran a number of so tests. you tell the truth, but you don't necessarily have to tell all of it. All the tests were negative, but what tests did you run? Right. We, Our normal ones. All the normal ones. <laughs> yeah. you know, all the tests. So it's just all we were worried about was respiratory damage and eye and skin damage and uh, you know, CNS depression, anesthesia, liver damage, CNS toxicity for your central nervous system, toxicity over time, and hearing loss from the explosions because they were very loud, and then shrapnel because these things would blow themselves apart. The clouds of stuff were all blowing downwind, which we were. <laughs> we're five kilometers downwind. And these clouds were blowing, starting to blow our way. Okay, and all these things were blowing up and the smoke and the nitrous and everything is coming this way. So we we have to worry about this. A, we, we need fire suppression and dispersal of these chemicals. Well, we were not allowed to go there. But once we started to tell the Venezuelans what was there, they prohibited us from visiting the area again and restricted us to the airport. That, that and the problem went away. 
we the weren't long enough. It's fine. <laughs> it the problem was, wait, he thinks we're all dead. <laughs> but it's fine. It's fine. So we talked about you know getting rid of the get get the residents out of the out of the area because this is like well, it was a fourth time. There's all these people living there, even though they were slightly upwind usually, you know, like less than a click, less than a kilometer away from this time. We said let's.